And the second person that I want to introduce is Thierry Drapeau. He teaches in the Department of Industrial Relations at the University of Quebec on Uduay. His research examines forms of cross labor solidarity throughout the Atlantic world during the early modern and modern eras. He's a co-editor of L'International Sera le Journal Humain de l'Association Internationale des Travailleurs à Ojibwe. And his talk is entitled An Unknown Shiver Agitates the Two Worlds, the First International and Global Context. Hi everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm Terry. Uh, first, I want to thank the uh, organizers of this conference for uh, having put such a uh, terrific program together. It's, uh, it's really amazing. I look forward to attending uh, many talks today and tomorrow. Um, what I want to talk about today is the uh, broad context in which the International Working Men's Association was created, uh, known today as the First International, in London in 1864. Uh, as you probably know, the prevailing master narrative um, of the founding of the First International is based on the claim that it resulted from an unbroken chain of events triggered uh, successively by the French Revolution of 1789, the Industrial Revolution of the 1820s onward, and the popular revolutions of 1848-1849. In other words, the history of the First International has been trapped in a Eurocentric story of working class internationalism in which the main protagonist is by default a free, white, nationally organized wage proletariat. Um, it would be nonsensical today, if not just plainly absurd, to claim that racialized workers in situations of unfreedom uh, are incapable of organizing politically across borders. The example of farm workers, uh, migrant farm workers who find themselves in a situation of relative unfreedom are a good example of how we can still organize across borders, even though we are uh, uh, trapped in a form of uh, bond uh, labor. Um, and it illustrates that uh, also that unfree labor does not uh, prevent uh, labor internationalism as much as it gives rise to different patterns, different modes, according to different settings. Uh, and in different places. Uh, so if that's so, why should we imagine that early industrial workers of Europe were the only one, only workers to dream of labor solidarity beyond borders? Um, the revolts and collective actions of enslaved Africans across the Americas in the 18th and 19th centuries have long been discarded by scholars of working class internationalism because they did not fit the ideal course of class struggle. Uh, and yet, as I will argue today, as I argue in books that, I, that I'm currently writing, um, not only were their border crossing resistance integral to working class internationalism, but also central to the political trajectory that led to the creation of the First International in 1864, which makes it necessary to transform the prevailing story uh, in a more inclusive and uh, uh, pluralistic uh, fashion. So I will develop my argument today in two parts. Uh, I will begin briefly uh, by trying to illustrate that contemporaries and members of the First International did situate the association in a much broader context, uh, which included racialized workers um, of the colonies, um, and that this inclusion forces us today to redefine working class internationalism beyond uh, the paradigm of the nation and beyond the image of the factory proletariat. In the second part, which will be more challenging given the time 
cloud, uh, I will try to put forward a new calendar that reveals uh, a broader political geography of working class internationalism in the Atlantic world, uh, which is the economic, social, cultural, and political space that uh, integrated the four continents surrounding the Atlantic Ocean, Africa, Europe, South, and North America. The calendar I propose is based on three key moments which are not exhaustive, uh, but still feature early internationalizing tendencies uh, that can be included in the alternative uh, story that I want to, uh, to tell. The first moment is the transoceanic revolt of seafaring workers turning to piracy between 1714 and 1726. The second moment is the impacts of the Saint-Domingue slave revolution throughout and beyond the Caribbean between 1791 and 1822. And moment three, the North American clandestine black liberation movement known today as the Underground Railroad between 1824 and the end of the American Civil War. Um, of course, I will, be, uh, I will only give you a summary of that uh, uh, development, uh, and I'll be able to, to uh, uh, provide more details during the Q&A uh, Q period. But what I want to illustrate is uh, that through these three events, there's a long-lasting and multi-pronged uh, tradition of working class internationalism that already existed in the early modern era with phases of incubation, eruption, uh, with that change according to uh, settings. Okay, so I begin. When we, when we look at the first international, when we begin to research what their, what its members actually said about themselves, it is amazing to see how they situated the creation of the uh, association in a much broader context than uh, what I've been reading about it uh, from historians and other scholars. Uh, I'll give you one telling example, which uh, is based on the title of my presentation today. Uh, it comes from the French socialist and uh, member of the Paris branch. Benoît Manon, who wrote in uh, uh, 1872 in, which, in what is the first history of the First International. Uh, he wrote that an unknown shiver that, um, he wrote that there was an unknown shiver that agitated the two worlds in the decade preceding 1864, by which he meant the European world and the colonial world. His conception of the working class movement was global. Uh, it included West European workers, of course, but also the un, uh, anti-colonial liberation struggles of the Indian people, 1857, uh, the self-emancipation movement led by African-American slaves in the US, and the revolts against serfdom in Eastern Europe and Russia. He wrote that everywhere the proletarians, whether free or unfree, or uniting to assist in the realization of, of their aspirations, still vague but ardent. It, it's necessary in order to address the, short, the shortcomings that have been uh, pointed out uh, in, in the past historical accounts of the First International to endorse this global uh, unitary understanding of the working class put forward by Malone and others. Uh, because they believe, and rightly so, that the struggle against slavery, the, the struggle against serfdom, the struggle for national liberation, and the struggle of the European working class was in fact one and the same. So this means that the roots of the first international are deeper, broader than previously thought and acknowledged. But to examine these roots, we first need to uh, modify our understanding of what labor solidarity beyond borders means. In other words, we need to rethink our conception of working class internationalism, which can no longer mean the solidarity of nationally organized blocks of workers, in which the nation, nation state is given as the natural setting. Um, and 
class identity is already given. It should mean instead uh, all the forms of political identification forged through solidarity ties beyond borders, whether state or geographic ones. This reframing, I think, allows us to postulate that working class internationalism can be translocal, it can be transnational, it can be transimperial, and can involve as much free and unfree workers. So with this framework in mind, the question now is where to restart the story. Where do we begin? So I, as I have suggested, I think moment one, uh, the first moment where we see the first manifestation of workers trying to organize across borders is in the Atlantic Ocean by seafaring workers who turned to piracy in uh, 1714. And why do I claim that? Excuse me. I claim that because workers, unlike their counterparts on land, worked in a unique workplace, which was the deep sea sailing ship. Uh, the deep sea sailing ship did not stay in one country. Uh, it moved around the globe. So it, it actually gave a transnational uh, movement to seafaring labor. And so when sailors revolted at sea, they not only seized a workplace, they seized a means of communication that put them in contact and put themselves in contact with other workers in distant places. Um, and so that's why I think uh, this is a good place to start. Um, and the intensity and speed of those interconnections between pirate crews was unparalleled on land. You, you, you could look at the first labor revolts or even peasant, uh, peasants revolts uh, during the reform, uh, the, the, the reach and the synchronicity of their revolt was, was not even close to what sailors did in the Atlantic world. Um, so I begin with piracy. Uh, we don't often look at Golden Age piracy, which is uh, this era of uh, maritime depredation. It's called Golden Age piracy. We don't often look at it uh, as a labor struggle, but we should. Many scholars, historians have, have actually uh, highlighted the, the labor aspect of uh, the Golden Age piracy. Uh, because not only did rebellious sailors frame their revolt in labor terms, but they also addressed and corrected what went wrong in their trade through piracy uh, in labor terms. They abolished the wage, uh, distributed plunders equally, they elected their captain, they uh, created early form of health, health uh, insurance fund, uh, and they also included, not everywhere, not all the time, but they also included African descendant sailors as equal crew members. But what they did, what is interesting in my work, is that they also created alliances amongst themselves across their ships, which extended the revolt beyond their individual crew and organized a sort of seagoing network of uh, labor resistance. Uh, they were crushed in 1726 with the last pirate crew hanged in Boston, uh, but their tradition persisted. Minutes? Okay, I'll go fast for the rest. Uh, their tradition uh, persisted. It erupted again during the American Revolution, which has been studied uh, a lot, but also during the Sinomine Slave Revolution of 1791. Uh, again, I think we should look at the Sinomine Slave Revolution as a workers' revolt, uh, something that C.L.R. Uh, James did at the uh, uh, WB Du Bois did as well. Uh, so we should look at the enslaved Africans as uh, first and foremost an enslaved worker. And uh, the Sinomine Slave Revolution uh, really uh, reached far. And uh, just to give you a few moments, a few dates, uh, Jamaica 1795, Venezuela 1795. Uh, there were uh, 
conspiracies provoked by sympathetic black sailors who tried to uh, spread the black uh, revolutionary model beyond Haiti, uh, well, what was to become Haiti. Uh, New Orleans, 1811, Cuba, 1812, South Carolina, 1822, with the uh, uh, Denmark Vesey conspiracy. Uh, so I think there too we see a sort of anonymous form of slave labor internationalism, a sort of hidden transcript that circulated through sailors across the Atlantic world, agitating enslaved Africans elsewhere, <coughs> who consciously, thank you, who consciously uh, tried to seize the moment and rise up, even though they never met black uh, uh, insurgents in Haiti. Okay? So that's why I called it an anonymous form of working class internationalism. Um, I don't have much time to talk about the Underground Railroad. I, will, I would love to uh, talk a little bit more about it, but what I want to say is that that moment needs to be reinterpreted as a workers' movement in the form of escape, which was transnational, uh, spreading to the Caribbean, Mexico, of course, Canada, um, and we should look at it as, uh, uh, a, as a featuring a fugitive mode of working class international, which means that you don't want to uh, transform your work conditions, but you want to leave them all together, and it was a collective movement, and that movement provoked the civil war, and the Civil War uh, was the setting in which uh, the European working class, uh, well, actually provided the setting in which the first international was created in 1864. I'm going fast here, I'm sorry about that. It's 150 years of uh, <laughs> history in 10 minutes. Uh, it, it was a challenge, but um, uh, I think that we should look at the first international from the Atlantic world in order to fully understand that, yes, the Polish insurrection, 1860, well, the anniversary of the Polish uh, insurrection was important in 1863. It was the pretext for a big meeting. But what really kept mobilized the working class in England, a little bit less in France because of the law. And yeah, so it gives us another uh, perspective on the making of the first international. Uh, thank you.